And this faithfulness of God then works out consistently in two directions. And this is important when we come to consider nurturing faithfulness in ourselves to reflect his faithfulness to us. It's important because this is the faithfulness that we're to reflect, this faithfulness he's got. It comes in two, in two directions, if you like. Firstly, God's faithfulness works out in personal commitment to people. Personal commitment to his own people. There's a classic example of God's faithful perseverance with the Israelites in Exodus 34. There they are, they're at the mountain and there's ten commandments. And Moses comes down the mountain carrying two tablets and down below Aaron has lost patience and he's dancing around a golden calf with all the others. Who'd lost patience, not clung faithfully to God. Dancing around the calf and Moses takes the tablets and he smashes them. And there's a lot of to and fro and a lot of praying and a lot of trying to deal with the faithlessness of the Israelites. And then God calls Moses back up again and reinstitutes the Ten Commandments. It's a, it's a tremendous act of standing by a wayward people, right? They've let their thoughts wander and their lives have followed from a faithful path. So Moses, Exodus 34, chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning. Exodus 34, verse 4. As the Lord had commanded him. He carried the two stone tablets in his hands. And then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. Maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. When God reveals himself at that crucial point in Israel's history, and yet again as he does that, he underlines what he is, what he's like. Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. This is who God is, the faithful one. And it is of the essence of God's character that his faithfulness maintains this covenant commitment to his people, in spite of their unworthiness. That's the background to it all the time. Their unworthiness. And that's what the Spirit leads us to reflect. Faithfulness to those who are not worthy of it. And that gets built into his people's devotion. Recurring repeatedly in the Psalms as his people under pressure seek their God. Another example, Psalm 86, around verse 15, round about there somewhere. Arrogant foes are attacking me, O oh God. Ruthless people are trying to kill me. They have no regard for you. But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And here comes the request then. On the basis of that's what God is like, abounding in love and faithfulness, turn to me and have mercy on me. Show your strength on behalf of your servant. Save me because I serve you just as my mother did. Now I don't know where that comes from in Psalm 86, just as my mother did. But it's sort of a giveaway line that shows you the power of a praying mother, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah? Fantastic. I hadn't seen that there before. It hit me quite hard yesterday. Mm. The power of a praying mother. Or father for that matter. Let's not get, you know. But there it is. <laughs> so there's God. Not only faithfully committed to his people... Throughout the Psalms, that is his people's consistent hope and stay. It's where they find strength and stability. Because he's the faithful one. And this theme is intertwined with his faithfulness to what he's promised them. His faithfulness is to them, you see. Personal commitment to his people. And out of that comes his promise, his word to them. His covenant faithfulness. Because the faithfulness he has to them is written down in the covenant. God's covenant faithfulness, sometimes translated loving kindness in the older versions. The Hebrew word that keeps coming up is hesed, his covenant love. It is so legendary, such a big part of who he is, that people like Wayne Grudem, who is excellent most of the time, and systematic theologians like that in his tradition. Right? They define God's faithfulness as being his faithfulness to his word. Now I don't think that's right. 
God's faithfulness means that God will always do what he has said and fulfill what he has promised. Wayne mm -hmm. Grudem, page 195. True. God's faithfulness does mean that he, he, he will always do what he says and fulfill what he's promised. It's amazingly helpful in what it affirms. But it, to my mind, it's amazingly unhelpful in what it doesn't mention. God's personal commitment to the people, not just to his word. Does that make sense? Am I, am I communicating this clearly enough? In fact, so closely does Grudem associate God's faithfulness with faithfulness to his word that he includes God's faithfulness under the heading of God's truthfulness. That's a bridge too far for me. God is faithful and he's truthful, but his faithfulness shouldn't be in brackets behind his truthfulness, which is what it is in Grudem's systematic theology. Now, of course, God's faithfulness does mean he'll never prove unfaithful to what he said. And there's a lot to support Grudem's idea in, in that sort of sense. The essence of true faith is taking God at his word and relying on him to do what he's promised. Yes, it is. But I've had a lot less success than I'd like in finding anything to read about the way God's covenant word is a pledge to his people. That is personal. That is, better still, that it is relational. His faithfulness is how he relates to me, first and foremost, and to his people. And we can argue that in all sorts of ways. We can argue it from the face of scripture. We can argue it from, you know, it's the nature of the ancient Near Eastern suzerainty treaties that lie behind Moses and the covenant, right? The idea of cutting the covenant with a king. It is pledging yourself to a people. And God has pledged himself in faithfulness to his people. So in Jeremiah 14, 21, the pressurised prophet pleads with God. For the sake of your name, do not despise us. Do not dishonour your glorious throne. Remember your covenant with us. And do not break it. It's always relational. God has spoken of how the people love to wander. Do not keep their feet from straying into sin. Shown how the drought they're experiencing there in, in Jeremiah 14 is the terrible consequence that arises from their unfaithfulness to him. And Jeremiah has been banned from praying for them, which is kind of an invitation to pray. Because God goes on and explains quite well, you might pray in that context. <laughs> and he, he sort of barges through like this Jeremiah and he prays. And Jeremiah is given the prayer by God from verse 17 that he should pray. We acknowledge our wickedness, Lord, and the guilt of our ancestors. We have indeed sinned against you. For the sake of your name, do not despise us. Do not dishonour your glorious throne. Remember your covenant with us and do not break it. It's a plea for God to be faithful to them. Of course, remember, he's the faithful one. He's the covenant-keeping God. See? There's the key to the ungodly and the desperate situation, the faithfulness of their God. And time and time again across Israel's history, in the face of godlessness, disobedience, calamity, then his isolated, faithful people plead his faithfulness to the covenant, his self-same, singular, covenant faithfulness, which saves faithless, kicking sinners to this day. 